Let's check. Welcome to this uh, fringe meeting of the 2018 Conservative Party Conference. This is an evening aimed at using pop music to encourage young people to join the party. I see that's largely failed. Uh, I last performed in this venue in February 1990. And uh, they say you play hands twice in your career. Once on the way up. Good to be back. It's not my joke, that. It's a joke by Ian McPherson, but I thought it was all right to do it uh, tonight. So, uh, actually, I was on a bill then with uh, Frank Skinner and Steve Coogan. Whatever happened to them? <laughs> so, uh, I've, I've, I've just come off, uh, I've finished in a long tour in April, I've forgotten everything that was on it. And uh, so, um, the only stuff that I can always remember is my uh, tryout set spot from the 1988. So I'm going to do uh, 10 minutes of that without changing any of the topical references. <laughs> Many of you will remember them very well. <laughs> Followed by a bit of new stuff uh, and then I'm going to go. So it is a great uh, honour to be here though. So here we go, the 1988 set. Uh, so, uh, oh. No, no, it's much more lively than those <laughs> uh, Six stone lighter. So, oh, it's great to be here and uh, to be out. It's good to be anywhere, because uh, at home I'm just pestered all the time. I woke up last Sunday morning about six o'clock in the morning and there was one of these born again Christian evangelists that they have now there. Uh, and he knocked the door and I answered it and he said to me, sir, the answer is Jesus, now what is the question? And I said, is the question, for which role was Robert Powell nominated for a BAFTA? Robert Powell there, and he said, he said, no, it isn't that. And I said, can I have another guess? He said, yes. I said, is the question, born in 0 BC, I am commonly regarded as being the inventor of Christianity, which J am I? And he said, no, it isn't that. I said, can I have another guess? He said, yes. I said, is the question, whose birthday do we celebrate every year on the 25th of December? Uh, and he said, I'll, I'll warn you. He said, if you're considering reviving this conversation as material uh, in 30 years' time, a line which used to get a massive laugh in the 80s, will inexplicably go to a baffled silence, which... I said, well, perhaps, I said, it will be an indicator of the increasing secularisation of society. I said, how can you possibly know? He said, how can you possibly speculate about what state society will be in in 30 years' time? I said, don't blame me. I said, this is a perfectly functioning, straightforward routine. You've chosen to take it off in a weird and conversational tangent. I said, can I have another guess? He said, yes. I said, I said is the question, complete the name, Remember it? This one. I said, complete the name. We did it here. Yeah. I said, it's the question, complete the name of this popular early 1970s item of hippie fashion footwear. <laughs> the blank sandal. And he said, I'll warn you again, he said. I'll warn you, he said. But it's now, in 1988, it's now about 16 years since that shoe was popular. In, in 30 years' time, you're looking at a piece of footwear from nearly 50 years ago. You know, do you think people are still going to recognise it enough for you to drop this out again as material in, in three decades' time? I think in King's Heath they will. So. Well, well, they'll still be wearing them. But, uh, I think it's retro. <laughs> I said, 
can I have another guess? He said, yes. I said, he said, in 30 years' time, he said, will you be altering the routine to bring in local references? I said, yeah, that's the kind of skills that I aim to develop during that period. I said, can I have another guess? He said, yes. I said, is the question, complete the name? He said, you're staying with the complete the name format. I, this. I said to him, that's right, you initiated this combat. I reserve the right to choose the weapons with which it's for. I said, thank you. I said, wasn't expecting that to get a laugh. I did it for myself. Really. Trying to claw some self-respect back from the evening. I said, is the question, complete the name of this influential uh, but now largely forgotten, early 1980s Scottish post-punk band <laughs> The Blank and Mary Chain. Uh, and he said, I'll warn you, he said the response to that could be unpredictable in 30 years. Because <laughs> there's every chance that that band, he said, while on the way now in 1988, May in, be enjoying a series of lucrative comeback tours. <laughs> I said, I don't think that will happen. How could they possibly <laughs> communicate with their by then ageing fan base in an accurate enough way to guarantee there'd be an audience? And the evangelist said, Well, I anticipate there's going to be some kind of global communication tool. Right? <laughs> Well, you'll be able to use something, maybe it'll be called a search engine, to target your own forgotten interests and then follow them out. He said, that will never happen. He said, he said um, do you think that talking about this will go well in the future? He said, I think I'll lose a lot of the room. But pointing that out will consolidate my appeal in some areas. He said, before it just plateaus out and tails away to nothing, with one woman laughing and not. And to my immediate left, that picking up over there, the laughter, consolidating in this area, over there, and back to nothing. I'm not pointing that out, that's probably the biggest laugh of the sex so far. I said, can I have another guess? He said, yes. I said, is the question complete the name of this largely forgotten late 1980s proto grunge Chicago rock band? <laughs> the Blank Lizard. And he said, I don't know, I've not heard of them. And I said, surely it's obvious what they're called by now. And he said to me, oh, you obviously think it's very clever to be sarcastic, don't you? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, you do, you were doing it then. And I said, no, I wasn't. If anything, you were. And that went on for about an hour. Actually, do you know what? None of that happened at all. I just, just made it up. Well, it sort of... All right, it sort of happened a bit. These, these kind of ideas don't come from nowhere, but there isn't time now to go into discussion about the nature of the imagination. But the, the, what happened, this evangelist did come round to my door, 32 Hereford Road, Acton, September 1988, and, he, and I, he did say to me, the answer is Jesus, now what is the question? But I didn't say any of those things. <laughs> I just went, oh, you know, I'm not interested in it. <laughs> And then I went back to bed. And then, about eight hours later, when I woke up, I thought of all the hilarious things that I could have said if I was really funny in real life. And, the real, and then I wrote them down, I learned them, and I made that routine out of them. And little did I know that nearly three decades later, it was still being really the only serviceable piece of material I've ever had. Before I descended into a maelstrom of self indulgence. Ten minutes has passed. So, another eight minutes to fill now. And then uh, with this next routine, the final joke is about two minutes long, so that's CSV. The allotted time. A um, lot of people get there. I just read thing now, this thing used to happen if you get the phones out and you have to put you have to put stuff up on the wall saying no phones in the dance floor. Everyone's you know, I noticed hanging, going around with a band now, the younger people, everyone's used to finding their way, using funds. It didn't used to be like that. For example, 
Okay, 1988, when I moved to London, you know, if you go to a place now and you don't know anyone, you can go on social media, can't you, and, and Tinder and stuff and, and find people and have relationships with people you've never met and stuff, but we couldn't, it wasn't like that. When I moved to London in, to do this in 1988, uh, I didn't know anyone, uh, so I, I went on Dateline, right, which wasn't on the on the internet, you were sent a form in the post, right? Uh, where are you? <laughs> Was it? Did the sex pigeon bring it? Oh, I'm so lonely. I hope the sex pigeon comes. <laughs> you can't be laughing at a mention of the post yet. Right? We, still, we still have the post. It's not inherently amusing. It's not time for Peter Kay to start remembering the post. Right? This massive tour. Right? <laughs> I've got two hours on remembering the post. <laughs> so we still, we still have to be here. Fucking hell, I've got no So Yeah, you were sent a form in the post, not on the internet like you would have now. <laughs> it's on the, and you, the form, there's all these boxes you had to tick. You tick them of your interest so they could match you up with someone with similar interests. So Hill walking, fishing, you know, dancing, whatever. And one of the boxes you could tick in 1988 for your interests <coughs> was marked jazz, stroke, folk. <laughs> <laughs> All the other musics, you know, heavy metal, disco, reggae, well, they're their own boxes. <laughs> but jazz and folk. <laughs> We put it together, you know, the, the date line broke, you just sort of had enough of it all, and you just like, oh, those fucking people. <laughs> but it didn't make sense to me then, putting jazz and folk together, and it doesn't make sense to me now, because they're different, aren't they, jazz and folk? They're different, because folk music, in essence, is about taking an ancient melody or phrase and asking the performer not to improvise with it, not to alter it, to act like an anonymous conduit, to pass it down unchanged throughout history for the benefit of future generations. Whereas jazz music, in contrast, as we've seen, is about taking an existing melody and inviting the performer to improvise with it, to alter it, to use their imagination, to change it ideally beyond all recognition. A process quite the diametric opposite of the folk procedure. <laughs> So I didn't tick that box, just wrote all that in here really tiny. <laughs> and that was what caught the eye of the woman who went on to become my first wife. <laughs> this is a sophisticated audience. I mean, you know, sort of cheer ironically at structured material. I know you can write jokes normally. Uh, yeah. That's what caught her eye. She was a jazz folk musician, my first one. <laughs> she was profoundly depressed because... Well, I'll tell you why. Because she suspected that what she was trying to do was to combine two incompatible approaches to the ultimate detriment of both. And I sympathise with her, to be honest, because at the time, I was in a double act with Richard Herring. <laughs> Put that on the internet. <laughs> What's said in King's Heat stays in King's Heat. That's the old maxim, isn't it? <laughs> that is it, probably. Um, but it's, it was weird being in a, in, a, in a jazz folk relationship because I. I never knew what was going to happen in the, in the bedroom department. I never knew <laughs> if we were going to have jazz set. <laughs> A wildly improvisational <laughs> procedure that returned to its initial theme only after every possible permutation of the exhaustion. <laughs> or folk sex. 
<laughs> far more traditional approach. <laughs> Obsessed with historical accuracy. <laughs> which normally continued way past the point where it seems to be entertaining. <laughs> Until one or both of the main protagonists were dead. <laughs> or a combination of both jazz folk sex. A wildly improvisational procedure, obsessed with historical accuracy, but enlivened at unexpected moments by the sudden introduction of a clarinet. <laughs> I'll leave you with a final joke. This is a joke that was at the, like, the end of my set 30 years ago. Um, <coughs> it's still really the only proper closing line I've written. Um, I'm going to try and do it tonight, although there's, certain, there's some problems with trying to perform it. But I will, you know, so, so um, and, uh, and thanks for uh, all kind of coming out for this gig tonight. It's been a great for us all to be on the built together and uh, coming back here has been really uh, brilliant for me. Uh, but uh, what are we doing again? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, I was talking to my, I was talking to my granddad the other day and he is, uh, well, he's, he's dead now. Because <laughs> I think he was 92 and I'm 50. It just about work, but he was, he was alive when I, when I wrote this. In the, late, uh, the late ages I wrote this joke. It was... So, I was talking to my granddad the other day. He's, uh, he's not for the sake of arguing. He's 92. He's not. You know. and, uh, and he said to me, I'm dead. I said, I know. For this, I've got it. Look, I think it's difficult opening for bands, I said to him. I said, what are you talking about? I said, it's hard. Not, it's not an ideal gig sometimes, and I just need a closing line to just let me. So, um, so I was talking to my friend the other day. He's 92 years old. He said, I'm not. He said, I'm dead. I said, I know. He said, but you know what? Nothing would give me greater pleasure, he said, than to live on. As the punchline to the closing joke of your October first set of your hair and hands. So, so, uh, looks like it's your first day. I said to Granddad, you are 92. What is it with the cabbage factory here, actually? Anyway, I said to him, you are 92 years old. What, in your experience, has been the worst thing about growing up so old? And he said to me, Stu, the worst thing about growing up so old has been watching all the friends that I grew up with slowly dying off one by one. I said to him, well, Grandad, you fed them those berries. Presidents, <laughs> <laughs> berries there, the suggestion. And the closing joke of tonight's set. Ten minutes for Nightingales. Thanks for having us. <laughs>